shifting into the critical approach to popular culture and we're back to Stuart Hall. So the first part of the semester we were talking about Stuart Hall's representations. Um, this is an article written by Stuart Hall. It's a really famous piece uh, called Encoding Decoding. And this is a picture of Stuart Hall here. Um, I had to go with this. I mean, it must have been the 1980s. Um, this is probably at like a academic conference and just looks incredibly awkward. Him with the uh, muscle sleeves going. Um, this woman who's probably like, oh my God, it's Stuart Hall. You know, she's probably like a PhD student. So it's just an awkward picture that if we were to encode and decode, we might get something different then than we get today, right? The whole idea here is we see this image and this image means something different to us in 2024 than it did whenever in the 1980s that picture was taken. Um, I'm getting a, a creepy uh, Me Too vibe in it. Um, but it's, a, it's an interesting picture. This chapter, we'll come back to the first screen, is all about semiotics. And if you remember when we discussed semiotics earlier, semiotics is the study of signs. And getting into the critical approach to popular culture, we're critical thinking. And what is critical thinking? Thinking, thinking against power. Thinking against power. So part of doing critical thinking is to look at everything and question, even when it's, or especially when it's uncomfortable. We have to go against the way we think about things to be able to come up with new thoughts, ideas, and explore systems that are more equitable to everyone. So things are never what they seem. Everything has dimensions upon dimensions, explanation, upon explanation. And I assign encoding decoding to you to begin to critically evaluate everything. And that brings us back to the good old circuit of culture. And the circuit of culture, if you remember, um, you have these different areas where um, phenomena, social phenomena are happening, they're all interconnected, and while there's a dominant way to go through this circuit, there's also the ever-crossing paths that go along with it. So as we've been talking about, when something is produced, yes, it gets consumed afterwards, but the produ producers are also thinking about how regulation comes into play representations. So all these things are active all at once. Um, so the thing about this cultural circuit is that it includes relations of people and things. Anytime we're talking about popular culture, anytime we're talking about society, it's important to remember that people are always at the root. When we briefly talked about the Sony Walkman one class, um, the Sony Walkman is interesting not as a piece of technology, but as a piece of technology that people create, people use, and at every instance it gets reevaluated and rethought about the way people use it. What does the Sony Walkman mean? What does it represent? So these are processes that are constantly going on. Um, so the social relations of production cannot be forgotten. The situation that people exist in when they're making goods cannot be forgotten. So I assign this to you to, to think further. Um, people make meaning of things based on their past experiences. So we do not operate in a vacuum. 
We all have life circumstances, situations that we experience as individuals, as collectives, that help and shape the way we think about the world. And every single one of us in here has different experiences that change the way we think about things, okay? So, he gives us the definitions of encoding and decoding. And I like these two images to think about when we think about the way that we're encoding and decoding. So encoding is the meaning put into messages. Everything from genre to the historic moment go into encoding these messages. And decoding is the meaning taken out of messages. Our social structure influences what we get out of the message. If we were to look at a news broadcast from 1990, we would get a much different meaning out of it than we would have at the time. So the same news broadcast, maybe we make it look different, maybe we recreate it so that it looks contemporary, but if we watched it, because different things are happening in the world, we get a completely different context of it. And I also want you to think here about what it means to encode and decode. Over here, <coughs> excuse me, I have kind of a writer's room in a conference uh, room. They're sitting at the conference table. They're discussing um, how to write things. Uh, if you, any of you have seen 30 Rock, which if you haven't, I recommend watching some of the episodes. They're funny. They give you a really good idea of what it means to work in a television writer's room. And so you get these people and they're throwing ideas at each other. They're trying to make a message to come out the other end. Now, I've purposely selected this image. There is some diversity in that image. You have men and women. There's at least two African Americans. Looks like everybody else might be white in the room. I mean, it's kind of hard to tell. But these are important dimensions when it goes to encoding. If you have a room full of white men thinking that a particular joke is funny, it's probably not. Um... I was actually watching Hacks last night. Have any of you seen the TV, the TV show Hacks? Yeah? And I'm on season three. Spoiler alerts ahead. Oh. Um, but the character played by Jean Smart, it's not a big spoiler alert. She's hanging out with these old comedians. They're all men. Um, I think two or three are white and one's African American, but they're all men. And um, one of them, she was so excited. She was like thinking the younger her, she's 70 years old. She's like, man, I would have killed to be in that room. So she's excited. They're all getting a colonoscopy together. And she's excited. They're drinking martinis. Now, to me, that's the strangest thing. I don't know how you wake up and get excited about a colonoscopy. I dread, I think, the day you had men start having to get them when they're like 50 or something. I'm dreading that. I do not want a colonoscopy. But they're like having a colonoscopy party. And she's excited. But then they start talking about bisexuality. And they start making these jokes, and they're like, they're, they're, they're being jerks, right? They're being a bunch of old men. And the writer that she works with is bisexual, and they're making just terrible jokes that are like, uh, they need to pick one, right? And it's, it's very cringe. And she has this realization, and she's like, oh, man, I got to leave them. Why did I ever think it was cool to hang out with them? Um... So she leaves, she doesn't end up getting her colonoscopy, and she's really depressed about that, even though she had just had one. It, it's a weird episode. Um, and now, 
looking at all of you being bored by it, you're like, I don't want to watch Hacks. That sounds terrible. Watch it, y'all. It's way funnier than me. Um, so the point is, is when you get when you don't have diverse people in the writers' room, then your encoded message can get really screwed up. And when people on the other end, um, so I specifically chose what looks like an African American family sitting there watching a blank green screen, right? Like you can imagine what's being watched here. But does what they come up with end up being the message that they consume over here? Probably not, right? There's always room in the scenes to take out a different meaning than gets placed into it, even when people are very intentional, okay? And that's what the whole uh, encoding decoding is important. And what this does is it reverses, you don't have to worry yourself too much about this. This is the discourse that he's intervening in, and this is the old paradigm of media messages. Basically, you've got um, the frameworks of knowledge, the relations of production, the technical infrastructure that goes into making a meaning. So it gets encoded in the structures. The programming becomes meaningful discourse. It gets decoded under a particular set of meaning structures. And the frameworks of knowledge, relations of production, and detectional infrastructure impacts how people read it. Um, so that's the conventional way. What this means to come back to connotation and denotation is, right, we get the idea of connotation. We generally think of connotation as subjective, that it has an associative meaning. And we'll come back to the fonts here in a second. Whereas denotation is often thought of as objective. It's the literal meaning of a thing. So what am I representing on both of these pictures? They both represent the same word. Cool. Cool. Right? Over here, the denotation is that the temperature is low. It's cool out. Over here, the connotation of the Fonz in his leather jacket with his white shirt, given with slick back hair and the thumbs up, he's supposed to be the epitome of cool, which this is a 1970s show that was based on the 1950s, so there's also some transgression going in here as well about what it means to be cool in the 70s versus the 50s. Um, there's a lot of different meaning going on here. But I'm sitting here in 2024 seeing a picture of the Fonz, and I think definitively that is not cool. Right? And I'm guessing that what I think is cool is entirely different from what y'all think is cool. Right? And for my parents probably watched this and thought the Fonz was cool. Notice though that we end up with these very different meanings. Um, but I also want to say, right, everything has a mixture of both connotation and denotation. Um, when I look at the denotation, Today, my God, this summer in Texas does not want to end, right? We cannot get away from it. It is October 8th, and whew, it's only going to be a high, in the 80, high 80s today. But if you look at the forecast, it's around 90 degrees for like the next two weeks still. This is miserable. But today it's not going. It's not supposed to break break 90. So then, what does that tell us? Uh, it'll be a warm day. Well, it'll be a warm day. 
but it will be comparatively cool. Right? Because the other day it was 94. It was 97. Right? And it's October. So now we're like, oh, 87. <laughs> Give it to. Right? That is a con that is denotation, even though we're talking about something as specific as um, temperature. My wife's family's from New Jersey, and when we go visit them in New Jersey, a hot day where they're like, Woo, it's hot, I'm sweating, and they're ready to jump in a pool is when it's 87 degrees. Which, by the end of summer, when it's 87 degrees, I'm very definitively not getting in a pool. Because I'm used to it being 105, and I go, that's a little chilly for me to get into a pool. Whereas if you're in a different place, 87 feels entirely different. Right? And my whole point here is it depends on perspective. And so even something that we think is denotative is actually still connotative. Um, so everything is a mixture of both. Here, we also have to think, and I don't think I have a slide for that, um, the term bias. I hate the term bias. Um, I think it's a bad word because things only seem biased when we think that a word has a strong connotation. But everything has a connotation. So we only observe it as bias when we have a different connotation. Something rubs us wrong when we're like, oh, that's not how I'm used to the things being. But that doesn't mean that the way we believe things to be isn't its own connotation, right? Um, so that brings me here to the word natural. Things that seem natural. And if you remember to earlier in the semester, there is no science of meaning that's worth anything. We construct meaning. Language is always moving. It's always evolving. So. Nothing in language is natural. Rather, we naturalize things using language. When something seems natural, something else is going on. What I call ideology that we'll talk about more on another day, ideology is at work. And ideology is an upside down picture of reality. So when things seem natural, we also need to recognize they're very much not natural. And Stuart Hall says, quote, they produce apparently natural recognitions. This is the ideological effect of concealing the practices of coding which are present. So if we go back to that picture, these folks in this room are trying to make things seem natural so that when we get the message, it doesn't confront the reality that we supposedly live in. But what we're actually experiencing is what he calls the dominant cultural order. The dominant cultural order is the language that messages tend to get encoded into. And, but it's also important to remember that it's dominant, not determined. It's dominant, not dominating. There's always room for an alternative encoding and decoding. And Hall says on page 483, we say, quote, we say dominant because there exists a pattern of preferred reading. And these both have the institutional, political, ideological order imprinted in them and have themselves become institutionalized. Okay? So the natural reading, the dominant reading, is institutionalized. 
we think it's natural because it's all we become exposed to. Ooh. However, there's three ways to do this. Three positions. There's the dominant hegemonic position, and that operates within the dominant code. You have the negotiated position, which operates within dominant code, but does so by creating exceptions to the rules. And we have oppositional code. And this decodes the message in complete oppositions, and it happens during moments of crises. So here, um, I have the example of a Rastafarian over here. He is, Rastafari is a oppositional code. The Rastafarian religion is based on creating Afrocentric codes that compete directly with European codes. It's all very intentional. So the dreads that Rastas grow, um, and see his are, are great, his beard is awesome. Um, over time, it, I mean, number one, this is a religious entity. And the signs that they incorporate are specifically about religion. And the dreads are as opposed to what they call bald head, I happen to be entirely bald, but the European way of cutting hair. So they're very intentional. The language that Rost has used is very intentional. Instead of understanding, they say overstanding, for instance. Um, I could go on and on about the language. That's a whole other project. But the whole idea here is this is an oppositional code. Rost has or, uh, originated in Jamaica. One big problem that's always happened in uh, Jamaican culture is the reappropriation of Rastafarians for more nefarious um, ways of doing things. So what a lot of um, black Jamaicans end up doing is trying to appear to be Rastafarian, and then they end up taking advantage of tourists because they think, oh, I'm dealing with a Rasta. Rastas are hippies, right? And then they end up thinking, oh, I'm going to do this thing, and they get robbed, they get taken for a ride in, in different ways. So that's more of a negotiated position, right? And here we have black Jamaicans using Rasta symbolism and maybe not doing it for any nefarious purpose, but for making those kind of connections, okay? Then you get the Halloween blue-eyed white woman with turning the Rastafarian style into purely style without any political um, aspect to this, without any religious aspect to it, it becomes completely vapid and mocking, right? Don't, white people, really nobody, if you're not a Rasta, don't go dressing as a Rasta for Halloween. Not a good idea. And this has become um, the, the dominantly coded in the United States as cultural appropriation, right? Um, so we can think about different instances where this comes up. And my favorite example of this uh, is the show Modern Family. Now, Modern Family aims to be a very progressive ideal about family, okay? Um, and we'll, we'll bracket the kind of racial sexism that goes into Sofia Vergara's character, we'll kind of bracket that, and they had a vision, okay, um, and in the 2012 election, man, that was 12 years ago, this reference is bad at this point, 
um, for multiple reasons. Um, but there was a joke where, so in the 2012 election, Barack Obama was president. He was running against Mitt Romney, um, who's now a senator from Utah. Uh, he had been the governor of Massachusetts. Uh, they, you know, they came along and as interviewers are prone to do, they ask Ann Romney what her favorite television show is. And she said, Modern Family. And the writers from Modern Family had a field day with this because Mitt Romney and Romney stand for quote unquote traditional family. And this modern family was constructed specifically against that. This is an oppositional code. However, and this will be key, key in a second, there is no such thing the traditional family. That itself is an ideological construct that has never existed for most people in America. But we'll bracket that for a section, second because the joke was that the creators thought this was hilarious and the creator said we would love to have President Mitt Romney preside over Cam and Mitch's gay wedding right because at that time gay marriage was illegal in the United States right so they were like yeah we would love to see that happen um, Mitt R Romney Later, I think two years ago, voted in favor of a national gay marriage law, but back in 2012, he was adamantly against gay marriage. He didn't do what the Democrats were doing, which they were doing this whole, like, well, marriage is between a man and a woman, I support legal unions, they were doing that whole bullshit. Supreme Court rules gay marriage is legal, right? But that's the joke here, right? Because Mitt Romney was against gay marriage. Ann Romney was against gay marriage. So the creators of Modern Family, they look at it and they go, we created, we encoded an oppositional code that was Modern Family. In one way, they're trying to, you know, make, to do this, right? This is the most typical family right here, right? The traditional, the three kids, mom and a dad. Over here we have the gay dads with the adopted uh, Vietnamese daughter. And over here we have a blended family that is also a May-December relationship, right? Because Sophia Vergara is the same age. Uh, uh, what's her name in the show? Claire. Well, that's Claire. What's Sophia Vergara? Uh, uh, uh. Nobody's with me on it. Hold on. It's Manny. He's Manny. That's her name. Gloria. Gloria. So Gloria and Claire are actually the same age. So this, you know, it's a whole nother aspect of this whole television show. But the creators thought they were encoding a message about a modern family. But what they actually end up doing for viewers like Ann Romney is reinforcing the idea of the traditional family. Now, the problem with the traditional family is that by and large in American history, the idea of a mom, dad, two and a half kids is fiction, where the mom stays at home, right? Because during slavery, enslaved people, families were intentionally broken up, right? Um, when you get into a lot of Latino families, you get into extended families living under the same roof. Family and that cohesive community is a much more important um, dynamic than uh, the white dominant 
idea the dominant code in america about what a traditional family is so already it's drastically different but anybody that's poor experiences having even if it's a quote unquote traditional family the mom and dad both having to work the kids um you know being latchkey kids all these things going on the traditional family in america statistically does not exist but the idea that there is a modern family allows for what I call a dialectic, the construction of the idea of the traditional family. All right? So it's actually interesting that these creators thought they were doing something progressive, something transgressive, but in actuality, they were reproducing, in Hall's terms, the dominant cultural order. And part of this is just, and this really leads us into what we'll be discussing next week, how media is formed, okay? Um, so we have here, many of you might not be aware of who he is, but this is Rupert Murdoch. He's one of the wealthiest people in the world, and he owns a lot of the media that you consume. So globally, you can see everything that he owns. He is the owner of Fox News, um, those that are really curious, but he also owns the New York Post, the Dow Jones, HarperCollins, but basically all these different things are organiza media organizations owned by Rupert Murdoch. Um, so when Modern Family was aired, it was actually produced and distributed by 20th Century Fox, which was um, the television network owned, or the television producer owned by Rupert Murdoch. Even though I believe Modern Family was on ABC, it, the studio was 20th Century Fox. So notice here, when you start thinking about, well, what goes into the production, the coding of messages, well, it's owned by somebody who is world renowned for a particular brand of conservative politics. So how can you expect anybody to produce a television show under those circumstances that would be anything other than confirmation of the owner's own perspective? Um, so the dominant hegemonic position is reinforced by media ownership. And finally, I want to give you this, and we'll talk about this again later. Um, the oppositional code becomes the dominant hegemonic position. So way back when punks started, you had punks doing punk style as specifically a working class oppositional code. People created spikes with engine grease or their mohawks using engine grease. They created piercings using safety pins. The chains on their clothing were from change, chains from their garage, right? The holes in their clothing were because they were beat up hand-me-down. Then you get into pop punk with Green Day in the early 90s, which was taking the transgressiveness and making it more of a negotiated position, right? Like, in some ways, they were still communicating in those earlier ideas of what a punk is. But in other words, they're in it for the money. Then you get to Avril Lavigne. And Avril Lavigne is, I think, the furthest thing from a punk. But I'll also never forget as a story. So one day, it, I, I was probably a senior in college. I was at a, at a um, Halloween party. I'm standing outside waiting for my friend. And I see this woman. And she's outside looking for something in some like stones outside of the apartment building. And I'm 
like, oh, what are you looking for? She's like, I'm looking for my nose ring. It fell out. I'm like, all right. It was a magnetic nose ring. Now, mind you, this is 2005. It's not like nose rings were out there, right? Many, they were very popular to have it, but she had a magnetic nose ring. And I'm looking at her, and she was dressed like a schoolgirl. So, because I'm so witty, I go, oh, what's your costume? A schoolgirl? Don't ask me why I said this. And she looked at me, and she goes, uh, no, I'm punk like Avril Lavigne and I just burst out laughing because that was the most ridiculous thing she was dressed as a schoolgirl on Halloween she didn't look like a punk furthermore be you don't go as a punk for Halloween the same way you don't go as a Rasta for Halloween right like that makes no sense there uh, I had a friend that was inside who was an actual punk right like I didn't get the connotations but that's how these dominant codes, these uh, negotiated codes, and these um, transgressive codes, oppositional codes go, all right?